Okay, hello everybody. My name is Kofi Makiwa and I'm a professor at Delft University of Technology. And um, as part of the ISC 2022 Circuit Insights program, I will be uh, delivering a talk entitled Coping with Variability. I'll begin by uh, with a short uh, self introduction. So who am I? Well, I had my education in Nigeria where I did a bachelor's and an MSc. And I also repaired lots of lots of radios and TVs. And that was also a very important part of my education because I learned how things really work. Then I moved to the Netherlands, attend the Philips International Institute, where I got a second master's degree. And then eventually I got a PhD at Delft University of Technology. Um, as far as career is concerned, I spent some time at Philips Research as a research scientist before joining the TU Delft, where I'm now a professor and the head of the microelectronics department. And what I like to do, what I like to do research on are uh, things uh, related to sensors, sensor interfaces, and mixed signal circuit design. So that's me. So let me get back to my talk. So what's the motivation for this talk? Motivation of this talk begins with the, by realizing that in many applications, signals need to be accurately scaled. Uh, so that means basically the amplitude has to be either increased or decreased. So you could think about um, amplifying uh, a small sensor signal uh, with um, good gain accuracy, better than 0.1%, so that it can be processed further uh, by either um, typically an A to D converter, and then you have some DSP following it. Or in order to make that A to D converter, we need to subdivide a reference voltage, uh, sometimes up to 20 with up to 20 bit resolution. So that's dividing a voltage into, let's say about a million steps. And the question is, how can we do this with inaccurate components? Let's look at those components. Well, first of all, it begins, you have to realize that all components will exhibit some degree of variability because all components are manufactured in some kind of process and um, all processes have a certain amount of manufacturing tolerances. So if you look at a resistor over here, you see there are different types of resistors. Some of them are basically a cylinder of carbon. Some of them are, have a carbon film, which has been carefully deposited on a ceramic tube. And some of them are even made by wrapping some wire around uh, a mechanical former. But for all of these types of resistors, the, the general formula applies that the resistance is going to be a function of the geometry of um, the resistor and its resistivity. Your well, geometry is a function of um, how you make the resistor and resistivity is about the material properties. And um, when, depending on how you make the resistor, you will, can make resistors with tolerances ranging from 10%, and then they cost they are really cheap, millicents, so uh, less than one, one euro cent. Uh, but you can also get uh, resistors with 0.005% tolerances, and those cost tens of euros. So basically, you pay your money, you get your quality. Now, uh, what about on chip? Um, integrated resistors. Well, integrated resistors are usually made in a, a process that involves taking a silicon substrate over here and then doping it with some kind of impurity. And um, that process creates a doped region in the silicon substrate. And that doped region has a certain resistance. And um, the last step is to make contacts to that resistor by um, connecting some metal to it. And the result is an integrated resistor. Now, you, you realize that in order to make this resistor, the things that are important are the accuracy of the masks, which create the opening into which the um, impurities are deposited. And it also depends, of course, on the amount of uh, doping that actually happens and um, both of these processes are not so well controlled and typically on chip resistors will have tolerances of up to 20%. So in the main on chip resistors are much worse than discrete component resistors because of this manufacturing process. Well, um, what about the variability? 
Well, there is one good thing about on-chip resistors is that they are manufactured very, very close to each other, right? So they are just a, they can be just a few microns separated, and basically they're all manufactured by the same process. So because of that, they match pretty well. Um, and how well? Well, it depends on how big you make them. Because what I'm trying to show with this picture over here is that if you look at the errors made by lithography, it's better to have make a resistor with a larger area than with a smaller area. And these two resistors, at least for currents flowing from left to right, will have the same resistance because resistance depends on the ratio of length to width. So these two structures have the same length to width ratio, so they would have the same re resistance. Um, but this one is a lot bigger, and so the errors in the length and the width if are uh, proportionally smaller. But finally, no matter how big you make a resistor, doping variations will still limit your matching to about 0.1%. Okay, so having said that, that was resistors. What about transistors? Because um, if we want to make um, exciting circuitry, we also need transistors, active devices. So active, active devices uh, require uh, many more masking and doping steps. So back in the 60s, when uh, MOSFETs were, had been invented, you would make a MOSFET by um, using some doping process to make the source and the drain regions. And then you would um, create a gate above the channel in between. And that was already a pretty complicated process. But in the meantime, uh, we have progressed because things have become smaller and smaller, and eventually we're losing control of uh, the drain because, um, yeah, the drain widths were coming into the order of a few uh, tens of nanometers. So people invented the FinFET, and in the FinFET, you have this structure. And basically, in a FinFET, the gate is wrapped around the, um, the channel. So the space between the source and the drain, that green area, that's the channel. In order to have more electrostatic control over the flow of current from source to drain. But if you look at these dimensions, they are now really small, three to five nanometers. And you can imagine, as, you, as from the example I showed you about the resistor, that now the variability is going to get even worse because the smaller you make things, the, the, the more um, significant are any lithography errors that you might make. And the state of the art in 2020 is that people have even managed to reduce the size, the width of this fin to about 0 0.6 nanometers, which is getting uh, going into, that, into the, the direction of a few atoms um, of um, the um, drain material. So we are kind of reached our limits. So we've made very small transistors, which is great because we can put millions of transistors on a chip. But uh, as far as the individual tolerances are, it's pretty bad. So now comes the question, OK, how can we make precision amplifiers? Well, um, yeah, it, to get a, a good idea of the scope of the challenge, here is a schematic of an op amp. Pretty standard amplifier. We use it all the time, but I probably no, most of you don't uh, have not considered what is actually inside an op amp. Well, this is an, let's say, first generation op amp or second generation op amp, the NE5534, which was very familiar to me because it was used in tons of audio power amplifiers, so I saw a lot of them. But you can see it consists of many transistors, many resistors, many capacitors, and as a result of all the variability of the uh, individual uh, components, the gain of this op amp varies quite a lot. It can spread by 20 dB. So again, how can we make precision amplifiers with this in the face of this kind of variability? Well, the first solution is to apply feedback. So that's a great technique, and uh, you can learn more about it in the lecture of Bizar Razavi. But the key idea is that you take an amplifier with a very high open loop gain, and then you put it in the feedback loop so that the closed loop gain is defined by the ratio of a few passive components. And since you are working with fewer components, you can make things more accurate because you are making, you have um, uh, much less uh, sources of error. Also important to note is that since we are talking about the ratio beta in this case, 
mismatch is more important than absolute accuracy. So that's why um, uh, we can make fairly good amplifiers on chip, because as I told you before, the resistors, which you would use to implement that beta, although the, the individual resistors have tolerances of 20%, but the mismatch between those resistors can be as small as 0.1%. So that's uh, one uh, solution to the problem. Another solution, if you want to get even better accuracy, is we can trim. So in the, let's say, discrete component world, you would use a, a potentiometer, and this is what they typically look like, and you would use it to adjust a gain-setting component. So this is a very simple differential amplifier, and you can imagine that by tuning the value of R1, you could change, slightly tune the gain of this amplifier. And the pro is that, yeah, yeah, it's easy to implement because you just take the amplifier that you already had and you make one of its components uh, tunable. The con is that, well, it doesn't correct for your drift. Okay, uh, because drift can be caused by temperature. As the temperature changes, the properties of the transistors and resistors in your amplifier will change. And um, as a result, well, um, the gain of the amplifier will change. Um, so what can we do about that. Um, well, I'll come to that, but let's think about how you do things on a chip, because on a chip, you don't have a little potentiometer that you can turn, so you have to do it in a different way. And the way that's typically done in, on, on chip is that you would make this resistor R1, or at least part of this resistor, out of a chain of unit elements. And then by connecting some switches, we can choose how many of these unit elements we will connect in series to make this uh, the actual, the final value of R1. Um, this is a little bit more complex because now you need a memory. You need a memory, a digital memory that will store the trimming code, uh, which in turn will control which of these switches will be turned on and off. And you need to make a DAC because this is essentially a digital to analog converter. You put a digital code in and it selects some analog components. Uh, basically selects a um, a certain a corresponding resistance. And uh, you can imagine that if I want to have, let's say, 10-bit resolution, then I need to make a thousand of these unit elements. So there's a trade-off between my trimming accuracy or trimming resolution and my DAC complexity. So that's a limitation. Can we uh, do uh, better? Well, the, oh, there's still something I have to tell you. There's one hidden drawback of trimming, and that's the fact that in order to trim, you have to adjust this resistor, and then you have to see what it does to your amplifier. So that means that you need measurement equipment. So you need measurement equipment to, put, to input a well-defined input voltage, and you need measurement equipment to measure the output voltage so that you can calculate the gain. And that, uh, that measurement equipment has to be more precise than uh, the amplifier itself, and so it tends to be rather expensive. Can we do better? Well, we can by using a certain class of techniques which are known as dynamic error correction techniques. And these are a class of techniques that continuously combat variability. And because they do this continuously, um, they also reduce drift, because even as the components are drifting, these dynamic error correction techniques will continue working to combat variability. So how do they work? Let's take an example. Suppose we want to make a divide by two, just a simple voltage divider. Well, here's your circuit. You put in the voltage here. You have two resistors, and they divide the voltage. OK, fair enough. Um, but your output would only be divided by two if these two resistors are exactly equal. Well, by now you figured out two resistors, they're never going to be equal because of manufacturing tolerances. The interesting observation, if you look, uh, think about this circuit a bit, is that the error that you get in this output voltage, it can be either positive or negative. It just depends on the relative values of these two resistors. So if R1 is larger than R2, so if this resistor is too large, then this voltage here will be too low and the error will be negative. If you have the opposite situation, that R1 is smaller than R2, then this voltage will be too high 
and the error will be positive. Hmm, that's interesting. So I, my, the, the error can be positive or negative. So then you start thinking, if I can arrange the error to sometimes be positive and sometimes be negative and take the average, then maybe I can correct my error. And that's the, that, that's the key idea. So what we can do is we can swap an average. So we have two resistors, they are mismatched, but in the one situation, we put um, the gray resistor on top. And then in the other situation, we put the gray resistance resistor on the bottom. And if we calculate the resulting voltages, we can, we can see that V out one in, in phase one will be V in times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. And V out two will be V in times R1 divided by R1 plus R2. And um, therefore the average voltage will be the average of these two V out one and V out two. And if we calculate it and we you can and, and take the average, you will get exactly V in divided by two. And this result holds for any R1, R2. This is a very interesting result because it means that basically I can take any two resistors, I can connect them in one way and then in another way, and then the average voltage will be exactly half. Oh, okay, this is pretty cool because it means that I can get perfect uh, accuracy, I can get a perfect divide by two with two imperfect resistors. But I have to do this dynamically. So how do I actually build a circuit? Well, this is an implementation. So here you have your two resistors. Now I'm showing them um, as having the same nominal value R and having a certain mismatch, small r. And I have a bunch of switches over here. And with these switches, I can reconfigure my circuit. So in this phase, you see that the input voltage is connected to the gray resistor, and then it goes to the white resistor and then it goes to ground and I take my output voltage here and then in phase two I switch push the switches into this configuration and now the position of the resistors is actually switched swapped because now the input voltage is connected to the white resistor and now the gray resistor is connected to ground okay so that's not too complex I just need a bunch of switches um, but what does the output of this circuit look like well, if I look at the output of this circuit, I, I will get, I will see a signal that looks like this. In one phase, the, the output voltage is a tad too high. In another phase, it's a tad too low. And the average of these two voltages is exactly V in over two. So that means that in order for this technique to work, I need somewhere to have a low pass filter. I need to be able to average. So I need to average out this ripple that's what we call it, this square wave. I need to average out this ripple and um, in order to get my desired output V in over two. But that's not, not, too, not too difficult. We just put an RC filter or something and we can do that. Um, also, what you can see from this timing diagram is that in order to get um, this accurate average, these two phases have to be operated with a an exact 50% duty cycle. But yeah, that's not too, also not too difficult because we have uh, accurate clocks in most electronic systems. So we can ensure that phase one takes a certain amount of time and phase two takes exactly the same amount of time. The last uh, source of uh, problems will be the switch resistance because so uh, switches are also not ideal. They have a certain uh, turn on resistance are on and these resistors should match very well. But typically we can make these uh, the actual swapped resistors much much larger than the RONs so that this source of error can be made really negligible. So this technique is known as dynamic element matching or DEM, and it's used in a lot of places. Used in high precision ADCs, uh, high pre precision DACs. It's used uh, to make um, precise uh, amplifiers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Can we take this further? Yes, um, it turns out that by using the same principle, actually I can extend this to make a precision divide by N. So not just divide by two, I can make a divide by N. And now I'm doing 
essentially the same thing. I'm using a bunch of switches to swap the position of N resistors so that effectively I'm creating this circuit over here. So I'm creating a circuit where one of those resistors is in the top position and all the other N minus one resistors are connected in parallel to form a resistor that has a value of R divided by N minus one. And this divider uh, should give ideally the uh, division ratio of one over N. So if I put an input voltage V in here, V out will be V in divided by N. And that's some homework for you. Give it a try, uh, try and analyze the circuit. And you should be after about probably 10 minutes, be able to show that indeed for any possible value of these resistors, if you um, run this dynamic element matching scheme and take the average voltage over end states, you should be able to show that the average output voltage is exactly V in divided by N. And as just a hint, I would say, if you want to start the process, just imagine the situation where just one of the resistors has mismatch. Okay, um, we can even extend this further and we can in general uh, make an M by N divider. Um, and you see the idea here. And now the switching scheme is a lot more complex, so I'm not going to show the switches, but it's still possible. And basically what you, what you want to do is apply the general principle that you want to have these unit elements, each of these unit resistors, occupying the same amount of time in each position. So basically you're cycling these resistors through n possible states, and then the average voltage difference across um, a part of this chain of resistors will be exactly V in by N. And this is the way that uh, the reference voltage of precision ADCs and DACs are made. And by combining trimming to reduce the initial mismatch and dynamic element matching, we can even make achieve 20 bit resolution. So PPM levels of accuracy. Okay, so, but let me um, uh, take another look. In, 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 in circuit design, it's good to look at how circuits behave in the time domain, and then look at how circuits behave in the frequency domain, because we can get different insights. So first we will build a model of our uh, dynamic element matched system. And one way of looking at it is that it's a sort of amplifier in parallel with a mismatched amplifier. So an amplifier that represents the mismatch or the error in the gain. So we have a gain of A, and then we have an error in the gain, and the gain can be either a positive gain, uh, so, uh, larger than one, sorry, or less than one. But the trick is that when we use dynamic element matching, somehow we are able to invert the polarity of the error caused by the mismatch. And I'm, I'm including this in my model by having this multiplier, which multiplies the input voltage by either plus one or minus one. So if we look at the resulting system, what we are essentially doing with dynamic element matching is we are modulating mismatch errors up to the harmonics of this square wave. So if we look at the output of this a dynamic element match system, we get a signal with ripple. And that square wave ripple that I showed you before, that is has harmonics. And basically it's it, it's contains the mismatch error, which is now being up modulated to FDEM, three times FDEM, where FDEM is the frequency at which we are rotating all of these elements. And when you look at it in the frequency domain, you can see that in order to uh, avoid these unwanted components from contaminating our um, low frequency signal V in, we need to design our low pass filter like this, the red curve, so that it rejects all the components at harmonics of um, the dam frequency. But there's a downside because now you can clearly see that this low pass filter also limits the signal bandwidth. Um, and in order to prevent intermodulation distortion, we have to strictly observe this um, inequality that the input frequency must be less than the dam frequency divided by two. Okay, uh, so far I've shown you 
dividers, but uh, it's uh, in many in many applications we want some gain, right? But now I've shown you how to make a precision divide by two. So you can use it in the feedback network of an amplifier to make a precision amplify by two. And then this, we do the same things. We have our two feedback resistors that are mismatched. We have some switches so that we can change the position of these resistors in the circuit. And, and again, if we look at, at our output voltage, the output voltage of this amplifier will sometimes be a little bit too high and a little bit too low. And if we take the average, we should get two times the input voltage. Or wait a second. Well, let's let's check that. Let's check that. So in the one phase, the gain will be, remember the formula 1 plus R2 divided by R1. It will be 1 plus R plus R divided by R. Uh, and then we want to take the average, so we divide it by 2. In the other phase, it will be 1 plus R over R plus R. Then we want to take the average, so we take uh, divide this one by 2. But, 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 when we sum this, we don't get 2. We get this. Oh, what's happening? So it's not working. Well, actually, um, it's um, it's still working because if we uh, look at it, the um, this term r over r is squared. And if we consider the original gain error, if we didn't use any dem, so we just had one of these phases, the original gain error would be r over r divided by two. But if you look at this gain error, it's actually this number squared and if you square a small number it becomes even smaller so if you had resistors with a tolerance or sorry a mismatch of 0.1 percent this process of dynamic element matching will improve this to one ppm wow so that's 20 bits and them is really the only practical way to achieve this these these kinds of accuracies Anyway, to summarize uh, uh, this talk, the key points I would like you to remember is that all components exhibit variability. So there are no magic components out there uh, that you can buy and they are just perfect. But we can, there are a number of things that we can do to improve things. We can uh, correct for variability by trimming, but the downside of this is that it doesn't do anything about drift. So you can trim it, in the, in, the, in, the, in the fab or you can trim it in the factory, but 10 years time, yeah, you don't know what's gonna happen. And you need extra measuring equipment in order to do the trim. The technique dynamic element matching or DEM allows us by swapping elements um, in a well-controlled way, allows us to achieve ratios with PPM levels of accuracy and it also suppresses drift. However, in order for it to work, we need to do some averaging so we need a low pass filter. And at the end of the day, what we can say is that dynamic element matching trades off signal bandwidth for precision. And so like most things in analog circuit design, there is no free lunch. So that was my talk. Thank you for listening.